Welcome. Today we're talking what causes canine osteoarthritis. The aches and pains our dogs have that we might not even see. We're going to be breaking that down with John Waterhouse today. So thank you for joining us on the journey. Stay tuned. Mr. John, how are you? Good, mate. And yourself? Good, good, good. Good to see you as always. It's good to be here. Yay. Well, I think we're ready to kick it off already. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, everybody. Welcome to All Things Dogs. What causes cane osteoarthritis? The ins and outs. We're here with John today, John Waterhouse, Dr. John Waterhouse. He's a veterinarian here in the United States, originally from Australia, from the land down under. And he really specializes in this area and working with dogs and their bones and their joints and all their muscles and tendons and all that. And so we're going to be breaking down today what really causes it, how we can avoid it, and what are the outcomes of it? So with that, I would love for John to say hello to everybody. Hey, John. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this. This is a fantastic and exciting uh, topic because we know that every one of our beloved pets will encounter um, degenerative joint disease somewhere through their lives. And so if we can get on top of this early and we can slow down the development of degenerative joint disease, and osteoarthritis is part of the degenerative joint disease, family will call it, we can give our pets the best chances of having a long and fulfilled life. So let's break it down. So where does it start? Where does it begin? How does our animals start to get this? Well, there are multiple ways that degenerative, and I'm going to, or let me step back and say degenerative joint disease is inflammation of the entire joint, and a lot of things cause that. So we know most of our joints are what called synovial joints. So they have a balloon structure that surrounds the joint that's filled with synovial fluid. I call it an egg. So it has like a, think of it as a shell, a membrane, and then you have the joint inside. And anything that causes inflammation inside that egg or that joint or that lovely environment, and it's really an enclosed, its own enclosed environment, causes inflammation, will cause what's called degenerative joint disease. Arthritis is just one of those types of things that can happen. But in humans, arthritis takes on a different form. So things that could happen, Michael, you asked, is trauma, um, infection. A fine object goes in there. Surgery can cause degenerative joint disease. Um, bacterial infection, but then just also confirmation and just aging process and the wear and tear on joints all lead up to that, we call it the whole blanket term called degenerative joint disease. Does it, how does it really affect our dogs every day? Do- you just kind of like gave a whole um, description of like what it is kind of in the, around the, the joints, the fluids and all that. I know we talk about this all the time. Weight. Weight plays a big factor into this, doesn't it? Yes. Yes. Yeah. And so and- it's so important that, and I think if I got this right, every pound that a dog's overweight it adds four extra pounds of sheer force. So if the dog yes. is, if the dog is, 10 pounds overweight, he's carrying an extra 40 pounds of sheer force on his joints. Is that correct? That's correct. And that's the same with us as well, Michael. So when we talk about uh, pet companions, this also corresponds to us as humans. And actually, it could be more because we put all our weight down through two joints, our knee joints and our hip joints, where dogs, uh, four-legged companions can transfer that weight between four limbs. But yes, if there was nothing more that someone could do, and it really comes, we could call this nutrition, weight, if their pet could lose 10% body weight, that would alleviate the need to go on, in most cases, non steroidal anti-inflammatories, other pharmaceuticals that have negative side effects, but they do a great job when they're prescribed for certain time periods or certain uh, conditions, but we want to, at the end of the day, have our beloved pet companion off any type of pharmaceutical. And so just losing weight makes them feel more comfortable. They're no longer sore, their joints are no longer inflamed and we can get them off the pharmaceuticals and supplement those with nutraceuticals to get 
the same effect. So is this a genetic issue that dogs have, or is this a condition that is brought on by poor health, let's say? 50-50. So we know that if a, uh, let's use, I'm going to say a Labrador Retriever, because they're the most common dogs in the United States, has a family history of hip dysplasia, that they will potentially develop hip dysplasia. So I call it 50-50. You're born with, you're born with it and then you have 50% chance of developing it or you're not born with that genetic pre, pre, I can't say that word this morning. You've got pre, there you go. You can say it for me, mate. Disposition. Uh, We we help each other out here. I love it. Yeah. And, um, you can then have a horrible environment and a horrible life and trash that joint. So we know, let's use, for example, my family has diabetes in the genetically on both sides of my family diabetes. If I keep myself fit, slim, don't eat too much sugar, don't drink too much sugar, I minimize the chance of getting diabetes. And But if I don't have a history of diabetes in my family and I'm out there and I'm 100 pounds overweight, I'm drinking fizzy cola every day, things like that. I set myself up to get diabetes. So it's that chicken and the egg. So I believe what you're born with is 50% of the equation and what you do during your life is 50% of the equation. And you can change your chances of developing things. And then we can add in surgery and and drugs as well if we use the example of hip dysplasia. But really, it's so hard to tell, Michael, is – if they're born with the genetic propensity, say, for hip dysplasia, are they going to develop later, in life, later on in life? No, because I've seen some dog owners or pet parents who have gone, okay, I know my golden retriever's got swaying hips as a puppy. I'm going to do everything I can to limit the chances of hip dysplasia when they don't get hip dysplasia. And then I've seen puppies that have beautiful hips on the pen hip score, like, top one percentile of that breed for not getting hip dysplasia and have hip dysplasia by the year age of eight because they've done everything you shouldn't do to prevent hip dysplasia. So it's, and that's the beauty, but also the frustration of what we do as a veterinary profession is we can advise, we can try and guide, but at the end of the day, it's 50-50. You can get it or you can't get it. I know it's a long-winded answer to that but it's one of those really hard questions it's like a paradoxical question there's not really any right answer to it well lately i've been known to be asking all these crazy questions that are multifaceted so if i do just start with one part of it and go to the next one because i get thinking about all these different aspects of what we're talking about and it's so intriguing to understand the ins and out of how to set our dogs up to win let's say i have a labrador and it's a puppy, and I know that it has a predisposition of hip dysplasia. What do I do so I do all the right things to potentially set him up or her up to win in their golden years? So the right things, firstly, nutrition. Um, On a good, balanced nutrition diet and not overfeeding. Uh, We know that there was a great study done by Purina where they looked at puppies and they overfed puppies over a 16-year period and we saw all the growth or abnormalities and things like that. And we can talk more about that study later. So nutrition is a big thing. You don't want to overfeed them because they grow, their soft tissue structure grows faster than their bones and we get joint laxity and we get other cartilage developmental abnormalities that affect them later on as well. Secondly, is if we know they have a history of hip dysplasia in the family, for example, we then get a diagnostic workup when they're young enough to have what's called one of the processes called the pen hip. And we, it's a radiograph, and we put them in a special device, and we put their hips under traction, and we take a radiograph, and we look at how the ball and the socket fit together. And that gives us a really good idea of, once again, a snapshot where potentially their hips are falling within a breed standard because now hundreds of thousands of dogs have been pen hipped over the last decade. We have really great results of if the hips look like this, it's going to result in this. Then 
we go the surgical option if they have horrible hips when we look at pen hips their growth plates are still open, we can do surgery to change the alignment of their pelvis, to bring that ball and socket back into position so they then continue to develop and they now have normal hips compared to dysplastic hips if you didn't do that surgery while they were a puppy. And so while the growth plates are open, we can go close growth plates and we can, I'm going to say, not genetically modify, but... Um, surgically modify and change the shape that the joint develops and grows into by closing certain growth plates, putting plates in, opening things up to actually give the puppies a normal hip environment and angles when they reach maturity. So it's really quite cool and fascinating and really exciting what we can do surgically for these little guys if we get on top of it early enough. This is really fascinating. So I'm, I have a room later today and it's actually with, um, her name is Dr. Lisa Schaefer and she's with Paw Print Genetics. And we're going to be talking about exactly what you and I are talking about right now is the genetics of our dogs. When we adopt a dog or we go to a breeder, you know, like we're talking about Goldens right now, they are, they have this issue. And so what you're saying, if I understand this correctly is if I'm getting a golden retriever, I know they have this issue. Let's say I then go to paw print genetics and I get a genetic test and it really shows me that they are susceptible to the hip issues. I then can bring them to you during their puppyhood, let's say, and you can keep an eye on them and say, okay, now's the time we can actually add this plate, this plate to help them so that when they start to grow and they get into a fuller body, that their hips are in the right places. Potentially, yes. And that's with the big potentially in front of it as a caveat. Um, because, yeah, the genetics only play 50%. And I, I'm probably um, painting a target on my back because you're going to be speaking to genetic geneticists tonight. But... Um, Yes, I believe it's 50% of the story. And then what you do with that information, and it's all that information, Michael, what you do with that information changes the outcome for that that beautiful um, little soul for the rest of their life. So it's about education and information at the beginning to go, okay, we know that they have potential for hip dysplasia. The genetic test came back and said hip dysplasia is they have the markers. Just because they have the markers doesn't mean they're going to get it. But it gives you an idea of, okay, we now need to watch the hips. What things do we need to do? We need to not feed too much. We need to get survey radiographs at the appropriate age variances as they're growing along to make sure their hips are tracking in a normal plane. And if they're not growing in the normal way they should be growing, we can take surgical steps to change those joint angles to maximize their chance of reaching adulthood with normal or normal-ish looking hips. So yes, it just gives you an idea of a, well, it's a roadmap, how to manage your puppy through the puppyhood growth stage to maximize their chance at a full and active life. So let's say I have, I'm going back to my puppy again. I have my yeah, puppy. Yeah, yeah. I have my puppy. We're starting to train. We're starting to exercise. What I know we talk about this in all our rooms, and I always like to bring this up, how important it is to actually warm my puppy up before I start to exercise or before I start to train. Um, is this one way that I can help prevent them getting bigger issues in the future with their hips if I just really take my time while they're growing as a puppy exercise them, stretch them out, warm them up, and then also cool them down when they're done exercising? Yes, and but that's very simplistic. We also have other, I have simple rules because, you know, and I, I'm not really complicated. So the British, um, British Kennel Club did a survey and a study and they realized that you want a rule of thumb was because everyone said how much should we train our puppies when should we train our puppies for agility um to go and do working events herding events and they said a good rule of thumb is five minutes of strenuous activity a day per month of age 
for a large breed dog. So when I say strenuous activity, I'm not talking about walking around the block and then playing in the backyard and doing all the things puppies do, but strenuous activity like uh, going for a little run or throwing the ball and playing fetch. Things that are strenuous, you should limit to five minutes a day per month of age. Because we know, let's use a, once again, the golden retriever, their bones don't stop growing till about 16 to 20 months of age. So almost two years, they reach maturity. So we need to protect that lovely cartilage as it's developing. And if we're doing repetitive activity, throwing the, the ball, the chucker, the stick, a hundred times, we're overloading those joints. I'm using that as a great exaggeration, overloading that cartilage. The cartilage doesn't develop properly and we can actually get shear force and flap and degeneration of that cartilage. Um, and they're called OCD lesion, uh, um, ununited ankyl process of the elbow, different lesions that we can get in the cartilage that then causes issues later on in their life. So, um, I know I went off track the question, but um, yes, exercise is really important. Then the warming up and cooling down, getting the puppy used to you touching the joints, feeling the joints, feeling for any areas of pain in soft tissue or joints, because remember, they're, they're really just a bag of bones because when you look at a radiograph of a puppy's bones, they're not connected. They're, they're running on cartilage. It's really amazing that the soft tissue structure, the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles, hold them all together while their bones ossify and fill in. And that's why doing too much exercise can damage those soft structures before they become a bone. And that's when they reach puberty. So that 16 to 20 months of age is really important for you to have your finger on that pulse to know where they are in their development so that you're not yeah. pushing them. We're not pushing. You don't want to push your puppy or your adolescence. There's an incredible um, agility. Um, oh, gee, I've got a mental blank on her name. You know, Susan Garrett, and she's world champion. She has um, incredible Kelpies as her agility dogs, and she's Canadian champion, world champion, the, pre, the, the captain of the Canadian agility team. Um, she, I was talking to her at a conference and, because most people, the AKC, American Kennel Club, says you can't start competing in agility until your um, pet is, I'm going to say, I think it's 14 months of age, but I may be wrong on that. Well, Susan says, I don't even introduce my pet to start training for agility, let alone competing, until it is mature, and that's 16 to 20 months of age, because... I found that if they compete and start competing at 14 months or 16 months of age before those boat growth plates close, my lifespan of that competition for that dog is a lot shorter because injuries um, wear and tear on the joints than if I waited till they, those growth plates close and then start training and bring them into comp competition around 24 months to 36 months. I get multiple years additional competition out of those dogs and that's where they get the championships are later on because they've learned. They understand how the course works and that. And so you get longevity by, and this is counterproductive, holding them back and not starting them till, even starting to train them till they've actually reached maturity. You talk about, and that makes sense because you want them to be strong and you want them to be healthy. And if you set them up with, I, I love the fact that you brought this to our attention, the 16 to 20 months, cause I've never heard that before. And I think that's so important that people understand that and know that about their dogs. I had no idea that the puppies are just a bag of bones. I, my friend just got a puppy the other day and I lifted him up and he was, he felt like a bag of bones, but I never knew that they were not attached. That's interesting. Um, when we're talking about, let's say a golden retriever again, since you picked that as our subject, let's, what do we do once we find out that 
we've done everything right. We've set them up to win. We, we, as a puppy, we've exercised them, but they are getting towards their teenager years and we're starting to see that they're having issues. How do we treat this? Can we go? Cause you talked about pharm- pharmaceuticals. You've talked about surgery. You talk about outside surgery, you know, s- stretches, exercises and all that. And you talk about non-pharmaceuticals. Where do we start treating it? When do we start treating it? Well, it depends what we classify as treatment. I have what I call then life strategy. Um, so every puppy should be fed, and there were tra- like I have a whole program on pu- how to raise a puppy from an orthopedic issue point of view. A program, and I say it's weighing the puppy twice a week um, because most, if it's a pure breed, you have actually tables to tell you what the male and the female should be at certain weeks in their development, what they should weigh. So you can compare if you have a golden retriever at 16 weeks of age, you put the little gold, the puppy on the scales, you look at the table and you can compare roughly if it's overweight, underweight, or where it fits in that general weight. If we have then a hybrid, so we have a burner doodle, or we have um, now those more common hybrid breeds have these tables that will tell you, but I also then say, well, look at the larger of the sire or the dam, um, and then divide it by, and there's tables to actually work out how, if you've got a cross, to work out where they fit on that table. So that's one thing, doing monthly and that also helps you to work out if your puppy's sick or not, because if they start losing weight, they'll lose weight overnight. You can then get on top of that because you're weighing them twice a week and then go, oh, they've lost weight this time. Oh, they've lost weight again on the next time I put them on the scale. Let me take them to the vet and see that they're okay. We can get on things earlier because puppies don't have the reserves to be able to, oh, my my. German Shepherds, the only, or my Golden Retriever is lying down. They haven't been right for a week or two. Adults, that's okay. But with puppies, they don't have the body reserves um, if they get sick. So this also allows you to get on top. So that's weighing them. Setting on a strategy of then when to feed. So that's the next one, nutrition. What's a good nutrition? Um, is it, and I'm not going to get into the difference between raw food and commercial kibble food, but working out. What is a good nutrition? And in my programs, I talk about how to read the bag of food and vice versa. And I try and give a balanced opinion of both. Then when to introduce supplements, because supplements can give the building blocks that they need to make sure they have all the nutrients and those building blocks, the glucosamine chondroitins, the sulfate, to help give their bones, their cartilage, the the resources they need because some diets don't have those resources. And for ex- an example is um, I had a Great Dane puppy come in to see me once and it could not walk into the room because of all the lax joints. And I was like, oh, my God, what's going on here? And when I asked the nutrition question, they said, well, we feed it porridge. And I said, beg your pardon? And they said, well, the breeder said to feed it porridge um, because they like porridge and it's great for them as a puppy. And so that's all they fed was porridge. Well, porridge has no nutritional value. And so this this puppy had what was called rickets. Um, I don't know if you know rickets, but that's a vitamin D deficiency and the bones become soft and become like rubber bands. And so this puppy had rickets and we cured rickets a hundred years ago. But yeah, so nutrition plays a big part in the developing puppy to give them the resources they need. Well, you know, especially because I, I follow Norell's package on how to feed a puppy and it's completely different than how to feed your dog because the puppy needs so many more nutrition um, value added food to their diets because they are growing. When we're talking, I just want to share this with the room too. If you're not familiar with the weight scale chart for dogs, you can just Google it. And there's a couple different charts that we're talking about. There's one that has nine images of your dog. And there's one that has five images of your dog. We are always talking about the one with the nine because it gives you a little more understanding what your dog is. And it's really actually something really valuable for you guys to actually download and take a look at and look at your dog and see where your dog is and see if your dog is overweight. 
And by having this chart, you can actually view the side of your dog, the, the top of your dog, and feel your dog and actually be able to determine if they're overweight, underweight. And if they're underweight, then you need to increase your food. And it's really important, too, that we talk about this, too, John, is, you know, if a dog's an athletic dog and it's competing all the time, they're going to be burning more calories. And so having this chart and really keeping your eye on it, because if they are a sports dog, they're going to be more towards the leaner side. But you definitely don't want them to get too lean. Right, Dr. Correct. And we then and it's like we call it anorexic and um, overweight. Um, we want to keep our pets through their entire life around a five on the nine uh, condition score. I like the nine, one to nine condition score, and you can find it. It's called the Purina Body Condition Score Chart or the World Veterinary, uh, I always forget the abbreviation for it, uh, chart, but it's one to nine. has really detailed description and photos of what you should be feeling and seeing to then judge where your, your pet is on that chart. I prefer that over the five chart because the five, you know, it's it's a great chart. But one, I'm going to say one to ten, you have greater um, nuances than one to five. Um, so that's the difference between why most people like the one to nine chart. I don't know why they do one to ten, but one to nine um, is you get greater nuances to then really just niche down with. So I'm looking at the chart. What's nice about the one through nine is they have one for a toy dog. They've got one for a large dog, yeah. a giant dog. So you're going to be able to find it. And they even have one on here for cats too. And it's really, it's by looking at the chart, because I'm looking at it right now, by looking at the chart, you I could see how often I see overweight dogs. I mean, people don't, I don't think people really understand what their dog should weigh. And there are a lot of dogs that are overweight. Now that I look at this chart, I'm like, oh, my God, it looks like supersize me in America here with these dogs. And we have a problem because media has conditioned us to, let's put the human cap on. We know what an overweight person and an underweight person is because you know, all our media is always about um, bikini models, fit people, and every ad we see. It's the reverse when it comes to our canine companion. Every ad shows an overweight, morbidly obese animal on all the dog foods, all the commercials, the breed standards. When I go to dog shows, I just went to the and spoke three weeks ago for the Bernese Mountain Dog Club of America, their annual general meeting. They had a thousand Bernese Mountain Dogs competing. Most of them are morbidly obese because that is how we have been conditioned to view them on TV commercials, everything like that, full rounded. Well, that's because they're selling pet food. And the pet food companies want you to eat more food, so they put photos of overweight dogs. So you have been programmed that that's the norm. And these tables recondition you because there was a great study done about 10 years ago where they went to the Westminster Dog Show. This is the Olympics or the what, oh, the Super Bowl of breeds and they all compete and they qu did a questionnaire of a couple thousand handlers saying, where do you think your pet would fall on the one to nine chart in body weight? And everyone's saying, oh, I think they're around a five or a six. Then they showed them the chart and 80%, this is 80% of the Dog breeders, breeders in the United States, their pets were two categories higher on the chart. So if they thought they were six, they were an eight. And if they were morbidly obese, and that shocked a lot of people. So I know the Bernese Mountain Dog Society are actually working to, re, to look at the issue of overweight because, as once again Michael says, one pound of excess weight equates to four pounds of additional shear force through the joint. And I saw some Bernese Mountain Dogs there who would have to at least be 50 pounds over. At least 50. I had a Newfoundland that came in that was 300 pounds. And the Newfoundland had to lose 150 pounds so we could do a TPLO operation on both of its stifle joints because it had ruptured CCL ligaments and it had to lose 150 pounds. And we had it in underwater treadmill five days a week for six months to lose 150 pounds. Wow, did he? So he did, he did. And But the, the 
funny thing was you had this 300 pound monster and the owners would send his grandmother in with this monster and she was 98 years old and she would have been wet 100 100 pounds (laughs) with this 300 pound monster oh it was fantastic so yes we got the weight off and the dog had the surgery uh six months later but it was an effort he literally squeeze, squeezed him into the underwater treadmill. He was so- it's, it's beautiful that you have this technology these days and you can actually take care of the animals and actually set them up to win in the sense of giving them a program on how to lose the weight and be able to go into surgery and come out of surgery and actually maybe have a better life. And that's what it's all about. And that's why we do what we do is to change the lives and give these little guys the best chance of a, a full and fruitful life. Yeah, beautiful. Okay, back to you, Dr. John. So osteoarthritis. Just say OA. Just say OA. OA, okay, <laughs> OA. The fact that you were you were talking about this one dog that has that was 300 pounds, he lost weight, he went into surgery. How successful is surgery these days? I know I personally, I talk about this, I had a back surgery this last summer, and they actually replaced the disc, and I was amazed on the technology and how far it's come for humans. How far has it come for animals? We are about, I'm going to say, 10 to 20 years advanced in veterinary medicine than in human medicine. Um, what I learned, and I came up from Australia 10 years ago to learn about regenerative medicine, stem cells, is just now starting to hit the human market because the barriers to entry to do this type of research is um, you don't need um, they use the animal models then to justify the human research and human models later on. So surgery is fantastic. And we actually then have every discipline that you can think of in human medicine. We have a specialist in veterinary medicine. We have brain surgeons. We have everything. So it's a fantastic field. Um, surgery is great, but you also know when you cut, you could never go back. And you're cutting. Oh, sorry, my iPods are, are leaving, so let me... And hopefully you can still hear me. So surgery is great, but surgery comes with its own complications um, down the line. Can you hear me, Michael? Oh, my God, it's beautiful. Yes. Okay. Yes, the surgery comes with its own complications. So we know that we – let's use a stifle joint and a CCL ligament injury. We know that when we open up the joint, just the process of opening up the joint will predispose that joint to start to develop degenerative joint disease because we're changing the environment, we're introducing um, irritation and inflammation that then sets that joint up later on in life to start to developing OA. Um, so we have to look at the pros and cons for any and every surgery. But like you with your back, there's a point where surgery is the gold standard and the quality of life after the surgery is so much better than the quality of life before the surgery, even with the detrimental long-term effects of having surgery. So, Michael, you just had surgery. You then had to go through the rehabilitation process. You now know that you're um, protecting that area of your back and that area of your back is not as good as it was before you ever had an injury there, but it's 80% than when you were... 40% functional without that type of surgery. So surgery is fantastic, but it also comes with its limitations. So when you're talking about this, I had another surgery. We're going to talk about my, I had a PCL replacement in my right leg and the doctor said exactly what you just said. And I never quite understood why he said it, but now I think he shed some light on it is that he said, since I had a PCL replacement in my right leg, that somewhere down the line, I am going to have to have a knee replacement. And I'm like, what does that have to do with my PCL? But is it because they altered it? They altered it, but also that PCL the way that then you had additional wear on the joint, um, that's setting up then for degenerative joint disease later on down down the road. So yes, they're doing patch up work and giving you longevity, but at the end of the day, you'll need other things because at the best, it really it comes down to if you can protect the joints at the beginning, that's your best. Everything we do, even putting an artificial joint in that, aren't as good as your original joint, but they're better than suffering through a 
um, degenerated joint or an arthritic joint or a collapsed disc or a bulging disc, you know what I mean? But everything we do can't get you back to 100%, but we get you pretty close. But so, then you've just got to know what the long-term ramifications of that are. I'm bringing it back to our dogs now. So the same is for our dogs. So we could get them back to maybe 80%, 85%, but it's better, like you said, better than the 40% that they had prior to the surgery. So once they go through surgery, um, we talk, you talk about pharmaceuticals versus non-pharmaceutical drugs. What are the two difference? So we know a, a pharmaceutical drug is something that's gone through trials and been registered by the FDA. If they've spent millions of dollars, years of testing, a bit like the vaccines for COVID. They have been tested and a lot of research has gone into the manufacturing, the components that go into it, and then the what are all the side effects. A supplement or a vitamin actually is regulated by the Department of Agriculture, and that doesn't have to have any justification, any research, Really, if we use the term snake oil, they can say anything they like on their labels and they don't have to justify their research or have any research done for what are the side effects. So that's the two. One's a regulated drug and the other's then a supplement or nutritional um, device or a food additive. And they're the three different categories, category, categories for um, supplements. And that's actually regulated by the Department of Agriculture, where the FDA then regulates drugs. Drugs then are there for a specific reason, but they also, we know that they have side effects, um, where supplements and uh, vitamins are more natural, so their chances of adverse side effects are a lot less, and that's why they're not regulated. If they have a adverse side effect, then they become more regulated. So if they go through surgery, are they having to go on pharmaceuticals because of the certain types of drugs that have to be needed after surgery, or can they just go non-pharmaceutical? I always say go on to, they need a combination of both. Um, when you go through surgery, so your painkillers are all pharmaceuticals because we know what your morphine, your opioids, and that all do. And you want to have that level of analgesia or pain relief on board after surgery because if you don't, you then set yourself up for something called analgenia or neuronal excitability or wind up is another word for it. And that's where the body's screaming and you become hypersensitive to pain, and that's a really hard thing to treat. And so we want to, when you had your back surgery, they would have put you on ketamine because in your spinal cord, you have, in your gray matter, you have something called dorsal horn. You have a dorsal horn between the shoulder blades and in your pelvis area. And this is where all the nerves come from your limbs to the dorsal horn, and that's like a little mini brain. And so if you put your finger on a uh, pin, you know, your, your finger, you retract your hand, that's because the dorsal horn is activated even before your brain's registered that you've pricked yourself, your finger's been taken off because the dorsal horn has registered something. Because our nerves can only transmit so far. And so when you have a abnormal amount of stimuli, so we don't give you pain relief, that dorsal horn gets stimulated, stimulated, stimulated. Oh, I heard, oh, I heard, I heard. It becomes hypersensitive. So what would be a one out of 10 pain if you pick, pricked your finger on a pin, your body then thinks when allodynia or wind up, you put your finger on it, it's like a nine out of 10. The pain is equivalent in your brain of I've had my finger amputated. And that's why pharmaceuticals play such a great role. Now, we don't want to send you home with a month's supply of opioids and get everyone hooked but they play a role and they're specifically designed for a specific function. Then we have our supplements that you should be on beforehand and afterwards that are doing, giving all the building blocks, the vitamin E, the omega-3 fatty acids, the glucosamine chondroitin, so that you have all that building material on site when your body needs it to help repair, lessen the chance of scar tissue formation, um, help you get up and running uh, in a more appropriate time frame. 
So there's a whole process to before you even go with your dog into surgery is to have them on these supplements before they go in so that that builds up their immune system, right? Oh, and the, and everything. We want to build up their muscle. So we want to have them, and that's where the strategy comes in uh, for their life. So an incredible new product just came on the market called Myos, and I'll be doing product. I'm in a four-month trial of it at the moment with four patients, and um, that will be coming out on. I do a product of the month review every month, and um, that's one of the, the products that will be coming out. Probably two months' time, I'll be doing the review of that product. Um, incredible product for building muscle. Another product is called Canebra out of Canada, and that helps build tensile strength and muscle and gives the glucose, mean chondroitin, and that then speeds up the recovery time. Then, you know, we talk about different modalities like laser therapy. I just did a video product of the month for this incredible new laser device that you now can rent. So your dog comes home from surgery, you can rent this laser, they ship it to you, you rent it very cheaply for four weeks after surgery and then you send it back in the mail and it's cost you a couple of hundred dollars compared to thousands of dollars to buy this piece of equipment. Um, so I just did a review and we just put that into our store today and I'm once again in a trial on that product. But there are things that we can do before surgery, things during surgery and things after surgery to help give the, the patient the best chance at a full recovery. You talk about after, which brings me to one of my next questions, but before we get to that one about your website, um, you keep mentioning, you keep throwing in every once in a while stem cells. What's your thought on stem cells with animals? Stem cells are incredible. Um, this is the new age. We are almost to the point where we no longer have to harvest um, stem cells from the patient. So what I mean by harvest, uh, so we would go in and there's, um, if we're thinking of our cells, our beer belly, that's called the falciform ligament. So I would go in and I'd surgically remove the falciform ligament or I'd go between behind the shoulder blade and remove, there's a fat pad then. We'd send the fat in sample into a company called VetStem. They would process the fats, extract the stem cells out and three days later ship back pure stem cells and we would inject those back into the joints of the patient. Um, this is where the world's going. Um, soon we'll then, they're now almost perfected the donor cell. So we extract the stem cells from a donor. They grow the stem cells in petri dishes. They wash them, grow them again. And on the third grow through a wash through plate stage, they lose all coding to the host. So now it's like injecting penicillin. You can keep this bottle in your fridge and inject stem cells into any patient from. So that's where we're going. We we're doing the research in Australia. Um, it's a little bit more cumbersome here in the United States because of re regulations and that with stem cells, but it's coming. Um, this is the new frontier. We can regrow organs, valves, um, heart valves. They're now regrowing heart valves. Uh, they regrew a bladder. Regenerative medicine is where the world's going. So you'll need a liver transplant. They'll take some of your liver cells. They will grow them in a lab and then they'll transplant back in your own liver in nine months' time. And the same thing is happening with kidneys and things like that. So we're getting to the point where we can start to regenerate organs outside the body, and so there won't be a need for a transplant because you will have your organs growing in a, in a factory, and then they put swap out your organs. And this is where we're going with medicine. Yeah, it's pretty wild. I actually... I'll come clean with it is uh, I um, did this wedding for this doctor down in Florida and he was all into stem cell research. And part of my thank you from him was I get to have stem cells for life. And so I'll go down to Florida and they will actually take, like you said, the fat out of my stomach and they'll sit there and they'll spin it, they'll spin it, they'll spin it. And I'll be, it'll be a whole day thing and I'll sit there for the whole day. And it's like really interesting when they re enter it back into your system through your blood supply and all that. It's just really, there is a difference. I feel a big difference myself. I feel like turning the hands of time backwards a little bit. So I, I definitely believe in the studies and, the results I've experienced has been just f fascinating, I have to say this. So I'm excited to hear that we're working with pets with this. 
Um, so, okay, so let's go on to our next subject really quick. Dr. John's got this website called Canine Rehab On Demand. And we're talking about surgery, dog going through surgery. There's things you do before. There's things that you do during. This is a thing that you then can actually do after. And Dr. John, would you like to describe it a little bit? So the programs are developed and it's the actual same teaching. So it's really two sides of a coin. I give the education breakdown of specific orthopedic conditions. So let's say hip dysplasia. I go through, and this is the same training I've given to veterinarians and rehab professionals for those over the last five years. So I make that available to, so you can understand the basis of that disease, what causes hip dysplasia, what things you can do to help slow it down, to remedy it, what surgical procedures are available to then mitigate hip dysplasia all the way through from puppies to triple head osteotomies, all the way through to hip replacement as a geriatric or total femoral head osteotomy where we actually take the whole ball and socket out of the hip joint and they run around without a hip joint. Um, And then everything in between, all the supplements. And then we pair that up with a 12-week home rehabilitation program that from day one, either surgical or non-surgical management, these are exercises you need over a 12-week period to get your beloved pet companion back up and running. Then we have a 12-week pharmaceutical and nutraceutical guide when you should be on certain pharmaceuticals, when you should stop those pharmaceuticals, when you should start different types of supplements, and all these guides in a store. So really, I created this with COVID because my veterinary students all around the world said, we can't get access to programs or rehab for our clients because of COVID. Can you produce a program for us. So we we launched the Canine Rehab on Demand platform about nine months ago, and I think we're up to 12 programs now. So I want to have the top 17 orthopedic disease programs up and running uh, in the next couple of months. But it's everything that the pet owner needs to know about that specific disease and all the information in one spot, even our store. They're the top manufacturers of harnesses, equipment, devices, laser equipment, nutrition, supplements in one place. So that's really, in a nutshell, what the Canine Rehab On Demand platform is, is to give veterinarians a platform that they can recommend their clients to go to and do the exercises after surgery or a specific diagnosis. And then also for the public to find it and find out more information about certain diseases that their pet may have, may not have, or may have been diagnosed with, and just learn more because there's so much misinformation out there on the internet that I wanted to create a platform that just gave facts, scientific facts backed by studies, and then people can make their own opinion. Which I think is so important because I have, I've looked at so many different articles and so many different topics on the internet since I've been on Clubhouse around dogs, and I can't tell you how much is puffery, how much is just foolish information just to get you to buy a product at the end of the article. And it's, it takes work to really start to navigate around all these different articles that are just written to sell items and not really to give you the really meat and bones of an issue. I wanted to share with everybody in the room what we're talking about with Dr. John's platform, because we had Dr. Christina here and she's a veterinarian also. She's in Liverpool And she was on here and we were talking about this platform that Dr. John has and how wonderful it is for the veterinarian. And I'm going to kind of give you an idea of what Dr. Christina said so that you can understand the impact for you, what it can do for you if your dog is going through surgery and is coming out of surgery and you're sitting there and you're going, what can I do? And Dr. Christina said it really simple. She goes, Michael, she goes, what happens is that a client will come with their dog. They'll drop them off for surgery. They'll be there. They'll be so nervous when, you know, picking up the dog and so excited to see the dog, but still all that anxiety is there and they'll come get their dog and the vet will sit there normally and get say, okay, now here's your exercises, maybe print out a paper, a sheet of information, or even spend some time with the client and discuss the different exercises that will happen in the next few months for rehab. But Dr. Christina said 
a lot of the time when she does this, she could see in the face of the people, of the parents, is that they're just so concerned about their dog and getting their dog home and getting their dog comfortable, and, or is their dog okay, is that they really don't hear any of this. And what Do- Dr. John has done, and he's created this website, um, Canine Rehab on Demand, where you can even sign up, like if your dog has a hip replacement and you get out of hip replacement and you want to know what to do with your steps are, he has got this 12-week program that you can actually access from your own home and do the rehab at home with your dog so you're not leaving your veterinarian's office after the surgery lost and confused. You actually now have a place that you can go to. How is that, Dr. John? That's a great summation of it. The program was also developed for actually the veterinary community to be able to prescribe because most people don't have access to rehabilitation. They don't. They live in towns that don't have access to rehab or DVMs, veterinarians, that actually have rehab knowledge. So really, this is, the program should have been called Rehab Business in a Box. And it it's there, was there originally just for the veterinarians to prescribe to their clients. But then I had so many people from outside saying, we don't even have access to a veterinarian. How do we get access to these programs? So we then made it available to the public. And I had a lady actually contact me from the Humane Society in Maui. And her personal pet actually fell out of the car window and actually had a four limb amputation. And she rang up crying. She's saying, I can't explain how much it meant to me that I went on to, it's called Tripaws, they're the biggest amputation society, saw your program bought your program, and when he came home, I had from day one what to expect. And she was the director of the Maui Humane Society crying for her own pet. You know, and that's what we do this for. Um, And then that gave her the whole 12-week program, have how to rehabilitate all the, every nutraceutical, pharmaceutical, rehab um, modality. Did she need laser, different things. And that's why I'm so excited about this new Medco vet laser machine that people can rent because the laser machine costs $3,000. No one has that funds, but for like $400 for four weeks, you can rent a laser that could change your pet's life. I mean, that's that's exciting stuff. And to be able to get that type of technology, knowledge and information to help with the anxiety because I don't want my clients ever to know the anxiety that actually I went through when my own personal pet was diagnosed with degenerative myopathy and this is decades ago and so that's what put me on to this path was to help hold people's hands and it's such a beautiful path i have to say it's just everything i've learned about you and everything that you're doing and all the different committees that you work with and all the fundraising and all the you know support that you give to the firefighters and everybody is just so wonderful so i'm i want to break this down really quick for everybody in the room so we we're talking about osteos arthritis today and if your dog has it what are the options what's the surgeries and it doesn't just stop there because there's all different tendons muscles disc everything that can go wrong with your dog in their lifetime as they get older so we're talking about how to identify it where to go for treatment what type of treatment you're going to need and then we're talking about dogs rehab with canine rehab on demand that Dr. John has that you can actually help with your rehab. So they're pretty straightforward. One, two, three. And it's really, I think Dr. John, what we're talking about here too, it's like so important that people actually really get to know their dog. And you, you talk about this is like when you have your dog, when you bring them home from a hike, pet them all over their whole body and just kind of feel them out because you may feel that if they injured themselves, you'll find it sooner than later. Is there anything that we haven't covered that we should have covered or we could have covered? Oh, God. Um, Michael, that's like, opening, we're opening Pandora's <laughs> box. Right. And my osteoarthritis program, like there's over six hours of veterinary webinar training just on osteoarthritis. So when you say we've, we've just been talking about this for an hour, and we've only just been touching the surface of different topics. So, um, yes, yeah, and that's why we'll continue this conversation every week. Um, and because this really is, it's the most important thing that will affect your beloved pet companion's life is degenerative joint disease. And understanding strategies um, that you can implement from puppyhood all the way through their life um, can slow down degenerative joint disease and maximize your 
um, relationship with your dog. And I get this is a horrible, horrible side effect of um, people who go through my program. They go, John, if I had known the bond that I would have developed with my pet by going through this program, I would have done this years ago because I now have this incredible relationship from doing exercises every day with their pet, monitoring them when they come home from work, as Michael said, patting them down, looking for injuries. You're just building that bond. It's all about the human, um, I shouldn't say pet, but companion bond and developing that because that's what we are here for. We're emotional creatures on an emotional journey. And and so I want to help facilitate that as well. And how well you do, Dr. John. With that, I'm going to go ahead and close out the room. Everybody, thank you for joining us today. Come back next week so we will be picking up this conversation and diving deeper into issues that our dogs have. And this is just one of many that our dogs go through in their lifetime, depending on their breed, depending on how they're raised and how they're taken care of. So we're all about setting your dog up to win. And thank you everyone for giving your time because I know your time is important and precious and you're here learning more about how to look after your pet companion. So I want to thank you and honor you for, for wanting to learn more. People come into these rooms that we host here and it's all about learning. It's about education. It's about what we don't know. We don't know. And I just, I've learned so much. And so I thank you again, Dr. John, for sharing your knowledge and your wisdom, not just with myself, but with everybody, just education, learning how to set your pet up to win. With that, I'm Michael and I'm out. Everybody have a beautiful day. Thank you.